morning, Metro. Good morning. It's not quite noon yet, but almost. Good to see you out here today. Second Sunday of our series called The Adventures of Paul, where we're looking at the life and the ministry of this great man, the Apostle Paul. And as Pastor Peter introduced us to him last Sunday, uh, saying that his influence on the world uh, has continued to this day, and he's really considered one of the greatest men uh, who ever lived. So it's definitely worth our while to pay some attention to him uh, in uh, what the Bible records in the book of Acts. Uh, last week, we found that this man, the Apostle Paul, had an encounter with Jesus uh, on the road to a city called Damascus. And as a result of this encounter, pretty much everything of consequence in this man's life changed. His very belief system changed. What, what he believed before, he found was incorrect. And he, and he changed. What, what he was passionate about before, what he had committed his life to, which was eradicating this thing called the church, and any mention of the name Jesus Christ, what he had committed to, changed completely. And now this man becomes an, an advocate for the church. And, and he starts teaching about this man, Jesus Christ. You, you, you can't find much in the life of the Apostle Paul that was the same after his encounter with Jesus. And, and I know it's easy for us to look at Paul and say, well, yeah, that was the Apostle Paul. Come on. One of the greatest men who ever lived. Of course, he had this very unique experience. Don't believe it. Don't believe it. Every one of us who has an encounter with Jesus Christ should experience that kind of dramatic change in our lives. And I would even go so far as to say if somebody says that they've had an encounter with Jesus and nothing changes in their life, then I'm questioning the depth or the validity of that encounter because that's how dramatic it is. When we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what happened to the Apostle Paul on that road. And we might think, well, great. Now the guy is a Christian and everything's good for him. And going forward now, he's got it right and everything's going to be pretty smooth sailing in his life. No. Within a short amount of time, Paul has two near-death experiences. And not because of accidents or something. Because of people who liked the old Paul way better than they liked the new Paul. And when the new Paul was, was advocating Jesus Christ, these people couldn't take it. And it was like, no, 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 Paul, you're done. You're finished. We're taking you out. And twice he had to be smuggled out of town before some groups of angry people got to him and killed him. The church in Jerusalem decided that Paul was too hot to handle. Yeah, great, Paul, we're so glad you're one of us now, but we're trying to keep a low profile here, and what you're doing is, is, is you're creating a very high profile. And so they took Paul, and they sent him off to the city of Tarsus, Paul's hometown. It was like, Paul, why don't you take a break? Why don't you go back home for a while, take a rest, don't call us, we'll call you. And for 10 years, Paul is out of commission, out of circulation. He's back in Tarsus. He's been put on the shelf, so to speak. Now, God was clearly doing stuff with him during that time, but, but all of his enthusiasm almost got him killed twice. And so for his own safety, they sent him back to Tarsus. Ten years later, the church in Jerusalem, where the headquarters of the church was, they start hearing rumors that there's something going on up north in a city called Antioch. Back in the day, Antioch was actually part of the country of Syria, a country we're familiar with today, just inside the border from Turkey. Now the borders have been redrawn, and today the ancient city of Antioch and the existing city uh, is actually inside the country of Turkey. But interestingly enough, and this is just a sidebar, the whole world is focused on that, on that area right now because that's precisely where all these refugees are crossing the border from Syria into Turkey as they're seeking a new life in Turkey. Refugees from Afghanistan, from Iraq, from Syria. They've had their homes blown up. They've been persecuted. And they're trying to find a peaceful place to actually live their lives and raise their kids. They're all traversing right through that very same area where Antioch currently is. It's still an existing city. 
there in Turkey. This guy named Barnabas, he um, goes searching for the Apostle Paul for whatever reason after he's been gone for 10 years. And he finds him there in Tarsus. And he says, Paul, there's something going on in the city of Antioch. There's, there's a church that started there. I think we should go there for a while. And Paul's like, well, I don't have anything else to do. So he goes with Barnabas, and they go to the city of Antioch. And, and what they discover and what they experience there is there is a church there that has grown organically, and it's pretty healthy, and it's pretty decent size. And they're doing some really good things, and God is clearly at work, and Paul and Barnabas decide, this is a good thing, and we want to be a part of this. And so to use metro language, they become partners in this church there in Antioch. And they start doing different jobs in the church. They're serving here. They're serving there. We read that they're doing a little bit of teaching, a little bit of this and that. Uh, the church wanted to, they took an offering and sent some money to Jerusalem Church, which was, was hurting financially. They chose Paul and Barnabas to take that money there. And these guys are getting more involved and more integrated into this uh, congregation there in Antioch. This church then becomes Paul's home church And it becomes the place that he launches out from on these different ministry trips of which we're going to look at one of them today. And that brings us to the 13th chapter of the book of Acts where we find Paul and Barnabas indeed there in the church in Antioch. Let me just read for us the first four verses of Acts chapter 13. And we'll join Paul and Barnabas on their adventures. It says, Now in the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. Let's just join in prayer together, can we? God, I want to thank you so much for the opportunity to gather here today. I thank you for this man, Paul, and that we can look into his life. And as he begins his true ministry here... Help us to relate to him. Show us those connection points, God. As we look at the church in Antioch, help us as a church to connect with them. As we look at the the life of Paul and Barnabas, his companion, help us to connect with them as well. God, open us up to whatever you have for us today. Help us to be receptive to it and willing to change, if that's what you're asking. Pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, I'm just going to tell you right now that Acts chapter 13 that we're going to look at today is a success story. It's a, it's a story with a good ending. It's a story that um, we can look at and say, yeah, good things going on in, in that book. It's got, it's got a happy ending. Uh, some of you read the chapter during the week, and, and, and hopefully you have seen that as well. But I always think that it's good when we see something that's a success to pause And look back and ask ourselves the question, okay, what was it that made it successful? And I know some of you people are in businesses where you do this all the time. There's a project that happens, it's completed, and you stop and you reflect back. You bring the right people together. What worked? Why was this a success? What, What can we emulate in projects going forward? And I think the same applies to this situation here in the 13th chapter of Acts, to, for us as a church now to look back and say, okay, what worked? Why? What were the ingredients that were in place that made this a success story? And that's what I'd like us to do today. And there's actually three components that we're going to discover here in the 13th chapter of Acts that are significant um, for the success of Paul's endeavors here in this book. And the first one is simply this, a healthy church. A healthy church. This was a church in Antioch. The second one was a life-transforming message. Paul had been given a message from God that the world was desperate to hear. 
and, and he communicated that message. And the third component is some courageous messengers. Can't have a message, be successful if nobody is willing to carry that message. So some courageous messengers. And we're going to look at all three of those here briefly in our time together this morning. So let's just start with the healthy church, okay? I read that passage for you uh, in the first four verses of chapter 13 that talks about the church in Antioch. What are the indicators in that passage that tell us that the Antioch church was indeed healthy? Now, this may sound a little weird to you, but the first indicator is that this church was like 11 years old. Now, that's not a magic number. Don't, don't, don't hear me say that. But there's something about a new church plant that says if they make it beyond that first difficult period, which is usually the first three to five years, if they make it over that hump and they're still viable, they're still, they're still moving ahead, they're probably going to make it. The Antioch church had been around about 11 years. They'd made it over those tough times. They, they, they've got some bumps and bruises. They've learned things along the way, but, but they're, they're more stable now. They, they've got a, a, enough of a, of a congregation. Um, they're, 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 they're strong. They're healthy. They're viable. So, so this church, being 11 years old, means that they're, they're old enough to have been through some tough times, but they're young enough to still be willing to take risks and not be stuck, not be entrenched, not be, not be bound by tradition. That They're still young enough that they haven't gotten to that point. The second component that we see here uh, that I think indicates that they were a healthy church is that they were spiritually healthy. And that may go without saying, but I want to point out that the fact the fact that there were several indicators that they were spiritually healthy. Right away, we find out that this church had people who knew and were investing the spiritual gifts that God had given them. Okay, they knew who they were. They knew how God had wired them, and they were turning around and investing that in the church and in God's kingdom. We're told that there were teachers and there were prophets in this church. Now, if you hear the word prophet, it's easy to think of the Old Testament, the prophets, these, these ones that would, would tell what was going to happen in the future and, and interface with the king and sometimes lead the people. In the New Testament, those with the gift of, of, of prophet, they were more there to keep people aligned with the word of God. And if the church or some individuals got off track and started to stray, the, the, those with the gift of prophecy, they, they kind of brought them back. No, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's see what the Word of God has to say about that and kind of kept people in alignment with God's Word. So there were people in the church that had that gift and they knew it and they were exercising it. We're also told there were teachers there. And this was really important for this church because the New Testament churches, the early churches, were made up of small groups that met in homes and from time to time, they would all gather together. But, but their, their primary, primary foundational place was in these small groups in homes. So these teachers, these people that had the gift of teaching and were exercising that gift, they would go around from home to home when these groups were meeting, these little local groups were meeting, and they would teach the people. A lot of people weren't literate in that day, so having a Bible to read wouldn't be very helpful to them if they didn't know how to read and write. So these teachers would come in and teach the Word of God to these people. So, so this is happening. The church understands their gifting. They're exercising the gifts that God has given them. It's an indication of spiritual health. Worship was a priority for that church, okay? As we look at the passage that I just read, we discover what are these people doing when the Holy Spirit communicates to them? They're worshiping. They're in a worship setting, okay? Worship was an important part of the life of this church. We read that prayer and fasting were normative for this church. It was part of what they did. It was a, it's what they defaulted to. It was, it was internalized. These are people of prayer, these are people of fasting. Several indications here that this was a spiritually healthy church. But probably the most important was we find out that this is a church that was responsive to the Holy Spirit. And so when we read in this passage that the Holy Spirit communicated to this church, hey, this is what I want you to do, the church was ready. That They were listening. They knew, okay, yes, this is what we're called to do we better respond. So several indications that the church there in Antioch was spiritually healthy. 
The fourth indicator that we have that, that, that this is an overall healthy church is the fact that this church was ethnically and culturally diverse. Because this church was in the middle of a community, in a, in a town that was very diverse ethnically and culturally. And it would have been very easy for this church to become a, an ethnic church. We're just going to be these people who speak this language and have this cultural background. That would have been the easiest thing to do. They didn't do that. They did the hard work of, of, of welcoming everybody. And even as we look at the names that were listed at the beginning of the passage this morning, these names are names that pertain to different countries, different regions, different ethnicities. We know that, that this was a, a church that was largely made up of refugees that had left the persecution in Jerusalem, Jewish Christians that had l run for their lives, and they ended up up here in another country. And they were welcomed there. And so you've got this mixture of Jewish people, of Gentiles, people whose, whose, whose mother tongues were different from one another. So they were doing the hard work of being an ethnically diverse congregation. And finally, I think the last indicator that this was a healthy church is we find that they were ready for the next big challenge. They, they were prepared. They didn't know what it was. When, when the Holy Spirit communicated to them, hey, I want you to take these two guys and set them apart for the ministry I have for them. They didn't know that was coming. But when it came, they were prepared for it. It didn't, it didn't like rock their world. It was like, oh, okay, thanks. Now we know. And so now we can respond to it. So we have these, these four indicators that this was a healthy church. But I think now we have to ask ourselves the question as Metro, be honest with ourselves, and say, how do we align with these four indicators? Are we indeed a healthy church here in Inglewood, New Jersey? The first one's kind of easy because Metro happens to be 11 years old. I think that's kind of cool. Okay, we're at that same stage where we have made it over that hump. We made it through the first three to five years. And if you talk to any of our folks, and there's still people here who were here from the very beginning, they'll tell you, they'll tell you it was rough. There were times we didn't know if we were going to make it. We didn't know if we'd be here three weeks from now. And now for those people to experience, you know, about 500 adults every Sunday that are coming to worship here and, and, and lots and lots of children, it's like, wow, did they even dream of this kind of thing back then when they were struggling? Are we even going to make it? Metro made it. Metro is a church that has some seasoning, had some bumps and bruises has grown through it, but it's a church that's young enough to still be light on our feet and not be entrenched. We can, we can move. We're, we're mobile. Metro is at the same place that the church in Antioch was. And what about our spiritual health here at Metro? What would you say about our spiritual health? I would say, I think we're doing pretty good. Now, before you say anything, I know some of you are thinking, wait a minute, I know this and this and this. Yeah, I do too. I do too. But we're headed in the right direction. And I think that, by and large, we are alert as a congregation to our growth areas. We, we know the areas that we need to be growing in, and we're responding to it. The, the reason we've, we're starting a half a dozen or more new underground groups combined with the old one is because we realize that what happens in here on Sunday morning is just kind of like a drop in the bucket. If we really want to be growing as a church, we have to be in a smaller group with people that we can really connect with. And as Deborah told us in her testimony, just do life with and pray with and be together with and learn and grow and study God's word together. And so we respond to that and we've got new underground groups. A lot of you know that starting in January 2016, we're going to do emotionally healthy spirituality pretty much at every level in the church. We're going to go through this journey together of emotionally healthy spirituality. Here on Sunday mornings, some of the youth are going to be doing it. The underground groups are going to do it. Why? Because we want to continue to grow in our emotionally healthy spirituality as a church. So we, we kind of know our growth areas and we're pushing into them. And to me, that's the sign, one of the signs of a spiritually healthy church. Why do we keep offering the marriage retreat a couple times a year? Because we know that healthy and strong marriages are going to make a healthier, stronger church. And, and we're doing another marriage retreat in two weeks. We still have a few spaces left. So come see us after the service if you haven't signed up yet. 
I think we're doing pretty good in our spiritual health. But how about our ethnic and cultural diversity? How, how are we doing in that area? Now, the easy answer is just turn your head and look around and see who's behind you and see who's beside you and see how many people do or don't have the same paint job that you do. We are an ethnically diverse congregation. There is no question about it. And, and we, we thank God for that. That's very intentional. We want to continue to create an environment that welcomes everybody. But, here, here's, my, here's my but. There are still some subsets within Metro that are much more comfortable just being in, in that group. Much more comfortable with people that understand what you like to eat. <laughs> or, or get it when... You say, but my parents speak this language. Oh, yeah, I get that. My parents speak that language, too. And, and you're more comfortable staying in those subsets, and you haven't really embraced the multi-ethnicity of this entire church congregation. Okay? Not everybody, but some of you have stayed in those comfort zones. My invitation to you is, is crawl over that barrier. Don't let that continue to be a barrier to you from integrating into the larger life of Metro Community. Or crawl, come on over. Come and join us on the other side of that. It's, I'll warn you, it's messy over here. Okay? It's messy. It's not always comfortable. There's tons of stuff to learn. We offend each other from time to time. But if we're honest and open, we learn even through times of offense. Okay? Now, if you just listen to what I just said... But your response to that is, mm, I don't think so. I like it over here. I'm going to stay with my peeps over here. If, if that's your response, then I'm going to say with all love and compassion, maybe this isn't the church for you. Maybe it's time for you to give up your seat for somebody who really wants to embrace what we believe and know that God is doing here. Because multi-ethnicity is in our veins at this church. It's the blood that runs in our veins. We take it that seriously. I believe the church in Antioch did as well. And we will continue to do that here at Metro. And I invite you to join us. And how about being ready for the next big challenge? Are we ready here at Metro? I believe we are. Do we know what the next big challenge is? I have no idea. I have no idea. But I believe when God reveals it to us, which I believe he will, that we are going to be ready. And it's going to be kind of like, oh, okay, that's what you've been preparing us for. So you see, I think we align pretty well with the Antioch church. We're not perfect. We haven't arrived. But I think we're on track to being a pretty healthy congregation, and God gets the glory for that, not us. Acts chapter 13, if there's no healthy church there, the rest of the chapter doesn't happen because everything is based on what Paul and Barnabas experience in that healthy church in Antioch going forward through the rest of the chapter. The second component of Paul's successful missionary trip here in Acts 13, is a life-transforming message. You can have a real healthy church, but if it all just stays within the walls and there's no message for people out there that are desperate to hear a message, then it's kind of worthless. But that's not what we see here in Acts. We see a life-transforming message. Paul and Barnabas are sent out. They go. They, they travel to three different places in the 13th chapter here. When they get to the third place, it's a small town, and it happens to have a Jewish synagogue. Okay, Paul's a Jew. Barnabas is a Jew. They're attracted to go to the Jewish gathering place, the synagogue, on the Sabbath day because they know they're going to find some people, and maybe those people will be interested in their message. And so that's what they do. And they get to this synagogue, and what we read is, that the, peop the leaders of the synagogue, they realize, oh, we've got some visitors from wherever. Oh, Antioch. Okay, we have some visitors from Antioch. Guys, would you like to share something with us? And for the Apostle Paul, that's like taking a piece of raw meat and throwing it to a dog. I mean, nothing makes him happier than somebody saying, do you have something to tell us? He's like, oh, thanks for asking. And he gets up and he preaches a sermon. And that's what we see here in the middle of the 13th chapter of Acts. When Paul has Jewish people in his congregation... 
he'll always start in the Old Testament because he wants to connect with them. Father Abraham, Moses, King David. And everybody's going, yeah, Paul, we're with you. And then he works right up to Jesus. And people aren't quite so happy anymore. These Jewish people are not quite so happy when he starts talking about about Jesus. But Paul makes the connection. He carries it through from the Old Testament. Oh, no, this is God's work. This is God's flow. This is what he's doing. Jesus is a significant part of the story that God is writing here. And, And so they listen to him. And that's where we pick up in verse 28 of chapter 13. Paul has brought them up to Jesus And Jesus had just been arrested shortly before his death. Let me read 28 and following. He's talking about Jesus. And he says, Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they'd carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. And in those handful of verses, Paul puts four significant ingredients of this life-transforming message. Okay, the heading over all of it is Jesus. That's the message that Paul has for these people. But then he tells them that this Jesus was executed. He was killed. He was crucified. He gave his life on behalf of others. And Paul says he wasn't just like half dead or beat up or or unconscious. No, he was really dead, so dead that he was put in a grave, put in a tomb. He was there for three days. He was buried. But he says God raised him up from the dead. Now, if the people weren't paying attention at that point in time, when Paul says, and God raised him up from the dead, it's like, oh, wait a minute. What's up with this? That that doesn't happen. And they get kind of skeptical. And then Paul says, but there were many witnesses that for many days interacted with Jesus after he raised from the dead. And then Paul says, and some of them are still alive now. They are still our witnesses to the fact that this man, Jesus, really did raise from the dead. Four ingredients in this life-transforming message. But Paul continues, verse 38. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, Everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. So Paul adds to his list here the forgiveness of sins. He says, why did Jesus do those first four things on the list? Why, why, why all that? Oh, it was so that you could be forgiven of your sins. Jesus did for you and us what he could never do, what you could never do for yourself. You needed him. We all did. And and Paul doesn't just say that Jesus did what he did to forgive some people from some sins. No, no. He repeats himself and he says through him, through Jesus, everyone, Jew, Gentile, everyone who believes is set free from every sin. Paul's telling these people that there is no sin in your life that Jesus didn't die for, covered, cared for. And then he kind of puts a dig into his Jewish friends in the audience when he ends by saying, this is a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. And what Paul is saying to the people there is, you you Jews, you guys that are still so strong in in your Jewish belief system, believe in the law of Moses and all this stuff, and you're hanging on to that, Paul's saying, you know what, that's incomplete. That was never meant to make a way for forgiveness for every sin, for every person. No, the law was just pointing people to Jesus. This is the provision that God made for the forgiveness of sins. And you Jews that insist on hanging on to your law, you're missing out. This is only part of the story. The rest of the story is Jesus. 
That's God's provision for you, Paul says. Hard news for his Jewish listeners to receive. That ended his sermon. Sabbath day was over. Time to go home. They walked out of their their little uh, synagogue together. And as they were leaving, some of the people said, are you guys going to be around next week? And Paul's like, yeah, we don't have any place else to go. He's like, well, would you come back and, 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 and tell us more? This is pretty interesting stuff. Paul's like, whatever, we'll be here. So a week later, Paul and Barnabas show back up at this same little synagogue. And instead of this handful of people that were there inside the synagogue the week before, they find a crowd. They find a mob. It's like, what's up with this? Well, it turns out the people that were there the first week started talking to their family, their friends, their neighbors. We've heard something we've never heard before. This is crazy stuff. Nobody's ever told us this. But you know what? It's worth listening to. And all kinds of people from the town showed up because they wanted to hear what Paul had to share with them. The problem was the Jewish leaders in that synagogue. They were like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. All of a sudden, they were feeling jealous. You guys never listened to us like this before. And now these strangers from out of town come in and you're like, woo, all gaga over them. And so the religious leaders in that synagogue started trash talking Paul and Barnabas. You know, one week they're singing their praises. Now they're saying to the people, hey, hey, pay no attention to them. These, no, these guys, they're not us. They're, no, this is bad. They're divisive. Don't pay any attention to them. Come back down to earth here, people. Verse 20, verse uh, 46. Paul is addressing the Jews then that were there. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly. We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I've made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord. So Paul adds one more item to the list here in his life-transforming message, and that is the word salvation. That's his last point in his sermon. Let me speak to that for a moment, because many of us who have grown up in the church, we love the word salvation. We love the word saved. We like to sing songs about it. We did this morning. God, our Savior. We like that. It feels good. The problem is, there's a really negative side to the whole concept of salvation. Because if a person comes to the point of realizing they need salvation... They've come to the point of admitting that there's a big problem in their life. That there is something so big, so powerful, so pervasive that I can't do anything about it. I need salvation. A person who needs to be rescued can't rescue themselves. And when Paul throws that word out there, salvation, as part of this life-transforming message, he's challenging these people. Folks, you got a problem. You've got a need you can't meet. The Bible calls that need death. It says you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now, what can a dead person do to help themselves? What can a dead person do to save themselves, to rescue themselves? Nothing. And so when we say salvation, God our Savior, we're admitting that we were hopeless, we were helpless, we were screwed, we were hung. We couldn't do anything about it. But nevertheless, nevertheless, the Gentiles, when they heard this, they were glad. And honored the word of the Lord. You see, these Gentiles that were there, they didn't have the law of Moses to hang on to and say, well, no, we're okay, we got this. They were kind of felt like they were stripped naked. And all of a sudden, here's somebody who was proposing a solution, a remedy, a savior. God, our savior. True. But you needed to be saved. The Jews 
felt they had their law and they had no need for Jesus. The Gentiles realized they had a need that could only be met by Jesus. And they received the life-transforming message, which was Jesus, executed, buried, raised from the dead, seen by many witnesses, offering forgiveness of sins and salvation. Some of the people who heard this message were offended. Some people who heard it were intrigued. And some people who heard it experienced a life-transforming decision exactly the same as the Apostle Paul did many years earlier on the road to Damascus. No less dramatic than Paul's experience. So let's go back to the Metro Community Church. How do we see ourselves in terms of this life-transforming message? Now in the first service, this is when the power went out and the screen went blank. And people couldn't look at the screen any longer. So I had to read it back to them. But we've still got power this service. And you can see the screen. If you've been here long at Metro, none of this is new to you. This is no secret. This isn't something we don't talk about. No, we actually talk about this all the time. This is our life transforming message here at Metro Community Church. Now, if you're new here, if you're visiting with us for the first time, this may be new to you. Great, I'm so glad you're here. But if you've been around a while, this is old stuff. You hear it all the time. It's that important. It's that significant. We're never going to stop talking about this message. Yes, this is integral to us here at Metro. Why do we put the cross up here every Sunday morning? Is it because it looks cool? Or does it remind us of Jesus who was executed? Why don't we have a Jesus on the cross? That's to remind us that God raised him from the dead. He's not on the cross anymore. He's alive. See, this is our message here at Metro Community Church. So in the 13th chapter of Acts... If you don't have a healthy church and if you don't have a life-transforming message, then Paul's journey is just a nice vacation around the Mediterranean. But with a life-transforming message and a healthy church behind them, sending them out, there's significance here. And the only component that's missing yet is the messengers. And that's the third and final component here in the book, in 13th chapter of the book of Acts. The courageous messengers. Let me just read one verse again for us. Acts chapter 13, verse 2, back at the church in Antioch. It says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them, period. End of communication. No further details given. Do you realize what God has done at this point when he's communicated to this church and all he said to them was, hey, what I want you to do is that guy and that guy, set them apart from me. I've got a job for them to do. Done. Well, what's the job? Where are they supposed to go? How long are they going to be gone? What's the itinerary? What are going to be the resources along the way? Who's going to go with them to help? When will they be back here to us? Nothing. Nothing. All they got was that one terse message. Set these guys apart for me. I need them. Sent into the complete unknown. A plan that the church apparently hadn't even been thinking about. Paul had already faced death twice trying to take this message to places where it wasn't very welcome. And now he's being asked to do it a third time. And Paul and Barnabas both said, yes, we're in. We don't know what it means. We don't know for how long. We don't know what will happen. But we are in. Two courageous messengers who were willing to take a life-transforming message out from a healthy church that was backing them up and sending them on a mission. How do we as Metro Community Church, compare to the courageous messengers from the Antioch Church. They had their Paul and Barnabas as their courageous messengers. I believe that if you go back through our history to the early days of this church, we had this core group of courageous messengers who somehow were able to dream about this thing that has become a reality. Led by our own Pastor Peter, some others, like I said, are still amongst us here 
and they were willing to take the risk even though they had no idea what the next step was going to be. And we owe a debt of gratitude to those courageous messengers back in the day. But I would say, by my observation here, that today the ratio of people who call Metro Community Church their home and those who have fully embraced God's call on their life, whatever that may be, is rather small. It's rather small. I, I, know, there's, there, I know there's many of you, but it is, it is rather small. I think there's a lot of us here that at some point in time, we kind of knew what God's call in our life was. Maybe when we were in college or some situation, maybe away at a camp, I don't know what, but it's like, yeah, I, yeah this, I, I believe this is what God has for me. But what's happened is that's gotten pushed aside. It's gotten put on a shelf or a back burner or something like that. And instead, we end up embracing the culture's call on us. What's the mold that our culture wants to push us into? Or, or we embrace our parents' call on our lives. What is it that we heard all the time growing up? No, no, this is what you're going to do. This is what you're going to be. Maybe it's our friend's call on our lives, or maybe it's our own personal call in our lives, but whatever it is, if we're missing God's call in our life, or if we're, we're, we're kind of holding God at arm's length in terms of his call in our lives, then we're missing out on what he has for us. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about everybody, because we've got some great examples here at Metro. I'm not going to name names, but we have people in our midst who I personally have watched walk away from significant sources of income to align themselves with God's call on their life. They, they've said, you know what? I'm not going to spend the rest of my life doing something that I know is not what God has gifted me and called me to do. And that's not to say we all have to quit our vocations. No, no, a lot of people can absolutely continue in their vocations and that may be the place that God wants them to be everything that he has designed them to be and this is not to say oh yeah everybody's got to like leave the country like Paul and Barnabas did no there may be some of you that God is calling to do something like that and we as a church want to get behind you a hundred percent but every one of us who calls himself a follower of Jesus Christ a Christian a believer God has a call on our lives. We've got to figure that out. And we have got to live into that. In Acts chapter 13, the beautiful success came when all three of these components came together. A healthy church, that was Antioch, some courageous messengers led by our guy, the Apostle Paul, and then a life-transforming message that was desperate to be heard by many, many different people. I believe here at Metro we've got a pretty healthy church. I know we have a life-transforming message. The question is, will we fully live into God's calling on our lives as individual, individuals and corporately as a congregation? Will we become those courageous messengers then that will complete that trifecta that God has designed? Now, if you read the, the chapter, this whole chapter like I encouraged you to do in the, in the email this week, you got to the end, and, and there's some stuff at the end that feels like a bit of a, a downer. Paul and Barnabas get kicked out of town, okay? After their second Sabbath there, they get run off. They're not welcome here anymore. Persona non grata. Get, get, get out of here, you guys. They were there less than two weeks. Now, how can we call that a success? Well, let me just leave you with two verses to answer that question, and we'll be done. At the very end of Acts chapter 13, verse 49, we read this. The word of the Lord spread throughout the whole region. The word of the Lord spread throughout the whole region. By Paul and Barnabas being there in town, boldly proclaiming a life-transforming message, enough people heard it, were impacted by it, allowed it to transform their lives and start talking to other people about it, that the word of God now started spreading far beyond what Paul and Barnabas could have ever done on their own. And then the last, the last verse in the chapter, verse 52, simply says this. And the disciples, these are the, the new believers, these Christians who had accepted the life-transforming message. And the disciples were filled with joy 
and with the Holy Spirit. Filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. We started with the Holy Spirit bringing a message to the church in Antioch. It comes full circle now to where people who have accepted the life-transforming message that Paul and Barnabas, the courageous messengers, brought are now filled with joy and filled with the Holy Spirit. God is doing his work. God is completing his plan. He's doing exactly what he wanted. These people lived into it. They embraced it. They had a significant part in it. Church, we have the same opportunity as we to live into, completely live into what God has for us, both individually and as a congregation. Let's pray together.